Again, thank you for coming on the program. I just want to introduce you for everyone who doesn't know. Uh, this is Dr. Brian Nosek. He is the director and co-founder of the Center for Open Science. Is that correct? Am I getting that right? Um, and he's done a lot of work into the reproducibility crisis and how we make science better. And I think he's a the perfect person to sort of put it together because so far I've made a giant mess and described the problem and absolutely given zero. One. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of many who described the problem, you know, but uh, it's a hard, it's an easier problem to describe than it is to put back together. Yeah. Um, so I was hoping that we could all lean on your expertise and get a few solutions. So I won't make you totally resell the, the problem um, because I've done a lot of that legwork in the other videos, but I'm hoping that this interview, we can really drill in on how to make science better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think at the core, the key solution is to align scientific values, how we idealize science to operate with what's actually incentivized and rewarded in daily practice. And right now, the core problem is that I'm rewarded more for getting things published rather than getting them right. And so what do I need to do to change the behaviors in the broad scope uh, or the incentives uh, so that I am rewarded for being transparent with my work, making my work reproducible and trying to be as efficient and open as possible so that the self-correcting mechanisms of science can operate. Right. And, and that's, that's really the problem. We just need more self-correction and more open data, more incentive, because as you said, scientists, they don't feel like they're even maybe allowed to do it. They feel like it's risking their career to be super rigorous, all these things. So what, what work have you done and where, where are we seeing progress in this area? Yeah, so the, the conceptual model of behavior change here is at the base is you need technology to be able to do the new behaviors, right? If I believe in openness, I believe in reproducibility, I believe pre-registration is a good solution, well, I need a place to be able to do that. So technology is one. The second level of the solution is that it needs to integrate with my research workflow. I'm busy, I've got lots of things to do. If you don't make it efficient for me, it's going to be hard for me to adopt that behavior. Those two are sort of base assumptions. And then the keys on top of that are the norms. What is it that others do in my community? And just as you said, well, I might believe in open data. And when you ask people, uh, researchers, do you believe in transparency? Almost everyone says yes, right? You can't really be a scientist and say, no, no, you can't. You just have to trust me. Uh, but people also see no one else is doing it. And so we have to address the norms. We have to show that other people are doing it and make it so that it's easy for me to do it. On top of that is the incentives. I can't just see that others are doing it. I need to be incentivized uh, to be doing those behaviors. It needs to align with my interests uh, in order to adopt. And then ultimately policy, right? I need to have the policies in place by institutions, by uh, journals, and by granting agencies uh, to make it so that these behaviors are in my interest and required to be able to be an employee, granting agency, whatever, uh, get grants, whatever. Okay, so examples at each level to show where progress is being made. Uh, let's start at the top, policy. Uh, there is a, a guide, guidelines framework uh, that we and many others worked on to develop called the top guidelines, transparency and openness promotion. And the idea of these guidelines is to provide us a common language, a framework for what are the behaviors that we want researchers to do collectively. And so it has eight different standards, open data, open materials, pre-registration of studies, replication, and then it has three levels of adherence. So uh, level one is just disclosure. I don't have to share my data. I just have to say whether my data are available or not. Level two is required. You have to share your data. Level three is not only do you have to share your data, but we're going to check, right? So if a journal adopts the top guidelines, then they decide what levels of each of these different standards they want, and then those are their policies uh, for uh, the researchers. So, and because it's a common framework, it's 
for any discipline to adopt and could be adopted by funders or journals or institutions. With that particular policy intervention, we now have more than a thousand journals that have adopted the top guidelines and implemented uh, these expectations for their, uh, their uh, authors. And uh, all of the major publishers have at least signed on to the guidelines, even if they haven't yet finished the adoption process at their journals. So that's some progress, right? A thousand journals is not trivial. Many that's of great progress. Are the, uh, you know, the leading journals, as it were, or at least the ones that get a lot of attention. Uh, and so that's moving incrementally. There's still, uh, funders are starting to pay attention to those issues and doing, some have done some leading work of adapting their policies uh, towards openness promotion. And the hard, uh, where it's most distant right now is with institutions. Haven't yet done a whole lot at the institution level. All right, so that's the top policy. Second level incentives, right? How can we get my interests for advancing my career aligned with the values? The best intervention uh, that we have so far that's realigning the incentives is register reports. Right, so the register reports, the idea is it's a journal-based intervention where instead of me submitting my final work, all of it's done and I need to get through peer review. And so I needed to have exciting results that reviewers will be enthusiastic about to say this is innovative and going to change everything. Register reports has the primary stage of peer review before you know what the results are. And so what changes in the incentives is instead of needing to get sexy results, I need to submit things that are really important questions and great methodologies to test those questions so that the reviewers and the editor says, we need to know the answer to that. Go do that work. Right? That just that shift of moving peer review to prior to knowing the results is a fundamental change in the incentives for everybody in the process. And already we have more than 200 journals uh, that have adopted register reports and the early returns are suggesting that this is working. And how is it working? Well, 60% of articles published through registered reports have no results as their primary outcome. That's awesome. It's incredible, right? Because the existing literature is more than 90% positive results. Everybody always finds support for the things that they're investigating. But we know that's not what's actually happening. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so when you don't know what the outcomes are, the process works as it should. We're asking important questions. We're actually designing tests to test them, and we're finding out what the answer is. And that's getting into the literature. Simultaneously, those outcomes, that lots of editors say, oh, well, that's why I don't want to adopt register reports, because that's, that's boring. No one will ever cite you know, negative results. But the evidence doesn't suggest that's true. Instead, the results are persistently cited, at least in these early ones, as much as uh, other articles in the same journals. So that's an incentive-based intervention. And 200 journals, again, is not trivial. What we're trying to really advance now in the register reports is partnerships between journals and funders, right? So now we can get stakeholders working together by having a funder and a journal commit to a single review process where if you get it through review, you get the money and you get the commitment to the grant or to commitment to the publication. Talk, talk the people at home back through why that's important and what is different about the situation now. Yeah, so the key here is that in what I do now in the lab is I spend all my time writing grants and all the grad students and postdocs in the lab spend all their time writing papers. Uh, and then I edit the papers. And it's two separate review processes, both of which are highly burdensome and both critical for how it is I can advance my career. If we put these two together uh, into a single process, it just makes it worlds more easy for me as an author to say, here's some interesting questions I might investigate. Is it worth me putting time into investigating them? Well, I can submit essentially a pre-proposal to a journal and get both rewards, the money and the, and the publication through a single process. Funders also really like this because if uh, so many funders fund research that never goes anywhere, right? It's conducted, but it's never reported. Lots of all the stuff that never gets published. Got it. Right. And so now you get both, you get both, right? The funder gets a pre-commitment. We're funding this research and a journal's already committed to publishing. 
So no one dislikes it. Everybody's like, yeah, yeah, let's figure out how to make that work. And so it's still early. Uh, we don't have good, we have a few good pilots, uh, but not a systemic uh, adoption of that uh, as of yet. But that's the direction. I was kind of surprised going into this and learning more about, uh, you know, how real science goes on, not just how it is in the movies or whatever. How much time is spent writing grants oh, is yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. I heard something like 20 to 30 percent of. Yeah. And if you just think about that in terms of the research missed. Yeah. I mean, it's massive. The, the yeah. opportunity is massive to really change the system and get back some of that time and just do more research. Uh, more, exactly. Right. I've spent so much time trying to get money to do the work rather than just doing the work. And that's a real counterproductive process in the grand scale. Of course, we need to be judicious with how we distribute resources and things, but surely the system can be more efficient uh, than it is right now. Uh, so this that's a big area for innovation, exactly, as you said. Okay, so we did an example of policy. We've done an example of incentives, an example of norms, right? How do we show that, well, yeah, everybody else has these values, but no one's doing it. Uh, we have a very simple intervention for this that's showing some effectiveness, and that is badges. So at a journal, you can uh, the journal can say, well, we're going to adopt badges for if you do some of these behaviors, like the top guidelines, open data or open materials, pre-registration. And if your, public, if your paper gets accepted in our journal and you do those behaviors, then we'll put a badge on your article, say open data, and here's a link uh, to where you can find the data. Or here's a pre-registration, here's a link to it. That's a little incentive for the authors, right? Oh, I get some acknowledgement for having done the thing. Right. But it's a real intervention for changing norms. And that's the key, right? Is if I, as a reader, never see other people doing these behaviors, then I believe that no one does them, right? No one shows the data. I don't notice it. No one pre-registers. I don't see it. Badges are a way to signal when those behaviors are occurring, making them more visible so that the early adopters who are saying, I just want to do this stuff because I think it's a good thing. I don't care about the incentives. I don't care about what the culture is like. I just want to do it because I believe in it. Their behaviors become visible. And making their behaviors visible makes it so that people are, who are inclined toward it but want to see that others are doing it, well, then they start to do it. And once they start to do it, then those that are sort of like on the fence about it say, oh, geez, now a lot of people are doing it. Maybe I should do it. Right? So you can shift norms, especially if the values are present, very quickly by making them really visible. The first journal that adopted badges was Psychological Science and did so January 1st, 2014. For the two years prior uh, to that, they had 3% of the articles had open data in Psychological Science. 3%, right? No open data. After that, within 18 months, 40% of the articles had open data. Whoa. That's in 2015, right? This year, 90% of the articles in psych science have open data, right? The change there is an absurd amount of change. And yeah. of course, lots of things are changing, uh, but it has far, far outpaced ch change in other areas of uh, psychological science or other journals. And I think the, I think the, the role of norms is, is essential here, that people in the field hear that these are important issues, they see that this journal cares about it. The, the journal has created this policy framework with badges to make it visible. And so more and more people do it. That's just the thing we do now uh, at this journal. Uh, so the combination of these things, right? Policy, incentive, and norms. And then the infrastructure that we and many others also provide infrastructure. Ours is called the Open Science Framework. Just makes it so researchers can do the behaviors, right? They have a place to do it, an ease to do it and the community norms are shaping around. So it's very early still in the sense that all of these are promising, they're all getting adopted, but we certainly wouldn't say that these are normative practice yet across the research community. But, the, uh, but it's nonlinear growth year over year for the last five years. So that's very encouraging for all of it. And the goal is that eventually if you can get it normative, then all of a sudden, not only does a scientist not feel like they, they can't do this. They feel like everyone's doing it. And so not only can they do it now, they feel like, oh man, this is how you do good science. Yeah, 
Right. And what's amazing about this is that very early career researchers, right, grad students who are coming into grad school, they, they see these behaviors and say, well, of course, is, isn't that how it's always been done? Like, like the, the behaviors that we are promoting are ones that everybody assumes is how science operates. Like, of course you share your data. Like, it's science, right? So something you shared with me, the, it, the, we were on another call earlier, but um, that I just want, it, this blew my mind. So I, I knew that sometimes researchers wouldn't share their data with like the public. And I, first of all, I thought the percentage of people who shared their data was much higher than it is, yeah. um, or at least was. But I totally assumed that every time you submitted a paper for peer review, the peer reviewer had all your data. Yeah. Of course, right? Of course. Of course you would assume that. <laughs> but it's not course, true. No, it's not true. <laughs> no, it is. Of course you would assume that. And it almost never happens. I, the, the assumptions that we have about how science operates are based on how we've idealized how science operates. And what has happened over the years is we've sort of implemented, not even really intentionally, but what is a culture of the process has emerged, which is very protective, uh, which is, well, you asking me for my data is you saying you don't trust me, right? That's a hostile act uh, in the culture where uh, really you just should read my paper and decide whether you like it or not from that. So the, even though researchers themselves recognize the value of transparency because it hasn't been part of the daily practice in any meaningful way. It hasn't been part of the policy framework or the regulatory framework of how science operates. We've gotten very used to not doing it. And so one of the biggest hurdles to get over is just to normalize it. The norms function as normalizing. Oh yeah, of course you can do this. But once you start doing it, when it's a practice like this, it can shift very quickly. How could we do it any other way? Why would we have done it anywhere? It doesn't make any sense that we would do it any other way. The, I mean, yeah, we absolutely need to change that. And you're right. It's sort of an ide ideology of science that we assume we just sort of like map on to the black box of science that a lot of us, you know, the layman do not understand. We just assume that's just how it works. And so we see the peer review like little line and we're just like, oh, well, this is just 100 percent true. Right. This has to be true because it was, you know, peer review. That's right. that's just what peer review does. Right. Um, something else I want to talk to you about is reproducibility. And this is another thing. I mean, I just like confronting all these m misconceptions in my own head uh, because I feel like if I, I misconceived of them, probably there are a lot of people who do, too. So there's. Again, in the ideology of science, which is everything should be reproducible. And in practice, that is still holds we want them to be, but there's kind of like not much tested in that front. Not many things are reproduced. There's, and that's because researchers are not incentivized. Nothing, you don't get much career advancement for doing uh, reproducible studies. You did a giant reproducibility study. Yeah. Um, walk me through a little of also, I saw that the response to that wasn't all positive. I mean, first of all, when you reproduce something, you're not exactly the friends of the people who paper maybe you reproduced or who's the chair of, you know, Harvard, whatever. I forgot who got mad at you, but. Um, uh, everybody. Everybody got mad at me. <laughs> everybody. Yeah, yeah. But how, how, do we, how do we, number one, incentivize reproducibility? And also, there needs, I don't know if this, maybe this is too idealistic, but it seems like there needs to be a decoupling of like someone's idea being published from holding on to it forever as like, this has to be true. Like scientists get attached to it having to be true. Yeah. Um, almost as like, uh, if it's found to be wrong, I should lose my career or something. And that shouldn't be how it is. We should be open to being wrong and opening ourselves up to, okay, yeah, I totally got that wrong. You know, let's do better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, findings become like possessions, right? They're my identity. I am associated yes. with this claim, yes. and so I try to defend it in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you hit on a really another core challenge in this uh, whole reform movement, which is the lack of incentives for doing replication studies, right? My career advances by showing things that are new, uh, showing something that's exciting, showing something we haven't thought about before. But science really advances slowly through incremental 
uh, confirmation, verification, qualification of the claims that we have. And so if we can't shift the environment towards uh, incentivizing replication, it's going to be hard uh, to have an efficient cumulative knowledge base. So the, the surprising thing in these large replication studies that we did uh, and we're still, we're, there's more and more that are going and many more fields are doing these sort of systematic replication efforts. Great. When we try to replicate published studies, uh, a surprising percentage of the time we fail to replicate the original finding. Now that could be that the original result was wrong. It could be that we screwed it up uh, in doing the replication, or it could be that there's some subtle difference between the right. two studies that we don't recognize how that, that it's important or relevant to but in all, whatever the explanation, the fact that we fail much more frequently than we might anticipate is suggests that we need to pay a lot more attention uh, to the reproducibility yes. of our mind. And so that is a, a important uh, thing to change. At the same time, we don't expect in our published literature, we shouldn't expect, I think, uh, that everything is reproducible. Really, what science advances by pushing out the boundaries of knowledge, right? It's, mm. it's like challenging what it is we un think we understand now with what might be. Uh, right. So we're going to have lots of false starts, lots of false leads, lots of areas where we thought something exciting was happening. And then mm -hmm. once we follow up, it turns out not to be true. That's totally okay. And in fact, that's a signal of a healthy science. But to your point, uh, just uh, when you were just saying that people are holding on to these as possessions, uh, right now, once something gets into the literature, it's hard to get it out in the sense that science isn't yeah. very efficiently self-correcting. Yeah. Right? We're not challenging our findings effectively. Mm. Uh, and that's partly because we're not doing the replication studies. But that also is starting to change. There are many more replica replication is in vogue uh, in some way. And the notion that replication is boring has been demonst is demonstrably false. People get very, very, very riled up uh, with replication now, uh, and it's very exciting and lots of debate, and some people mad, many people energized. Uh, and so that has been a very positive re reorganization of how people think about replication, is it's a way to confront our existing understanding and see where it needs to be improved. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, to your point, I saw something uh, where they go, you know, how much of the literature would you expect in a really healthy scientific community to be uh, replicable? Yeah. And nobody was thinking 100 percent. Nobody yeah. thinks all right. studies should be true. The important thing, though, as you said, is that when they are wrong, we should be reasonably we should reasonably expect that we do catch these things um, and hopefully as soon as possible to realize that, oh, this path is completely useless. Yeah. We should, you know, pivot off to a new direction. Um, and that's where sort of uh, the problem is, is if you don't have incentives, you know, scientists are not martyrs. They're not, we should not expect them to like stake their career and like throw away a good career in order to be heroes in the scientific, you know, like don't get paid much to replication. We should incentivize these things yeah. and incentivize the people basically going back with a fine tooth comb and be like, wait, is this... This should be a regular part of science. And uh, I want to get your your point on this. First, first, how can we, you know, you, you said we're, we're more and more normalizing that. Um, is there any kind of injunction we're making on the journal level or anything like that? And then two, do you think that I've, I've seen all the claims of a replication crisis around psychology, mostly, and biomedicine. Um, and there's sort of an epistemic superiority around you know, you know, the physics, chemistry. I want to get your take on that. Maybe. Yeah. So I guess I asked you two questions. All right. Well, I'll answer the second one first. Uh, and it is uh, very much uh, there is mostly attention has been on psychology and biomedicine. Uh, but by and large, because those are the communities that are actually looking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yes, it may be that there are bigger challenges in some fields than others don't actually have a good evidence base to assess that yet uh, because every community that has started to examine the reproducibility of its findings has found it to be below what they might expect, uh, have found areas where replication has not been easy. And it's hard to characterize at a 
discipline level, uh, what the replica replicability rate actually is, right? There's all kinds of places of variation. Like in my field, psychology, there are some areas where replicability is very, very high, uh, others where it's low. Uh, and so we're still trying to unpack where is it that this is a challenge? Why is it a challenge in some places more than others? Uh, so that, the I think, as the broader research community looks at this more closely, they will, we collectively will find that it is a challenge for everyone and there are some ways to make it more efficient uh, and better operating uh, than others. And some fields will be leading and others will be following. That's how it goes. Uh, so then you had a, oh, incentivizing replicating. Yeah. That the, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is an interesting challenge because new and exciting findings our drivers of new directions, right? Just is what it is. It is more exciting uh, than the verification efforts that happen with uh, replication. It's possible to have new innovative ideas come out of replication efforts uh, and maybe even frequent. But we sort of have to acknowledge that there's likely to be a standing difference there. So there are a number of different things that uh, research communities are doing. The basic fact of replication is now understood in some areas to be publishable is a big step because <laughs> okay. a lot of this replications have been getting done. They're just getting filed. Through. People do them to try to get mastery in a new area, succeed or fail to replicate it, and then put that data aside and go on to do innovative novel research, whatever. Uh, so that is helping. But another, this is an area where funders can play a particularly good role which is to actually make calls uh, for replication studies for areas of research that are important, right? Researchers need the money. Uh, funders sending a signal that the replication is valued can be really useful. And there are some really innovative ways that that could be conducted as well. So funders can do things like say, uh, here are the top 10 studies that were published by research that we funded in the past past five years, we've identified these as the most amazing findings. We will fund replications of those 10 studies, just propose specifically how you can conduct those. Right? There's all kinds of things where we could use resources in a very efficient way to target those things that are the most important findings, the things that are changing the direction of a discipline, to work on verification so that instead of spending $100 million on the preclinical clinical pipeline, and then discover that it wasn't actually a reproducible finding. We spend a lot less money up front uh, seeing, okay, yeah, this part we understand, this part we don't understand here, we're having some reproducible chance, whatever, uh, but get that verification initially to then justify uh, the bigger investments following. And this seems like, yeah, like particularly interesting, I think you hinted at it, in, in like medicine and things like that, where the application really matters and you end up actually just pouring a ton of money into it anyways. Yes. And so, as you say, like an injunction early on could be possibly more. So efficient, right. To be able to have that intervention early on. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, give me like, I, I know our time's wrapping up here. Um, give me like a horizon of the open science movement, the good thing is that we're seeing progress. Yeah. Um, of course, the bad thing is, is that we've only, we've just seen how big the problem is. Right. And so uh, it's easy to get a little bit like I'm like making two videos and I have a whole interview about how bad the problem is. Yeah. Um, one of which is, is your story of, of, you know, your story of feeling like, OK, I, I'm I shot myself in the foot by doing a replication, you yeah. know, <laughs> uh, so 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 talk us through whether you're optimistic, what what you see the landscape being. Yeah, well, I am congenitally optimistic, so that will always be uh, the case, but I think there's good reason to be optimistic here. The challenges are big, but the huge lever that we have is that the research community already recognizes, almost universally, that the culture of incentives is not ideal, that, it, that changing it would be great. And that's been, a, that's been understood for a long time, but what's different this time, what's different now, is that the stakeholders in science are getting together to actually make change. And there is a substantial grassroots movement across different disciplines 
of people saying, well, we can change this, right? There's an activism component of uh, recognizing that the culture exists because the members of the culture let it exist. Uh, and that we can change uh, that culture of incentives and norms and policies and practices. So the, the mindset, I think, is in the right place uh, for change. We also are seeing adoption of some of these solutions, right? We know what the behaviors are that need to be done. Pre-registration, sh sharing your data, your materials, your uh, research process. There are, there are physical infrastructure solutions to help make that happen. And these norms and incentives and policies are gaining adoption. And so that nonlinear growth, as long as we can continue advancing that as a collective, uh, we will see substantial change. Then the next component, I think, beyond that, if you're talking sort of horizon, is, yeah, okay, we're now seeing what people are doing, but how can we make it more credible? How can we up their game of the quality of the research? And one of the projects that I'm most excited about for this, this sort of horizon time is called SCORE. And the goal of SCORE uh, is to create automatic measure, indicators of research credibility. So as everything else, let's let the machines figure it out for us. Uh, machines read the papers that are coming out of in science uh, and give the findings scores. This one's a 97. We can really trust it. This one's a 32. I don't know about that one, right? If we can validate machine learning methods for assessing initial credibility of claims, then it could dramatically improve our efficiency of identifying areas of uncertainty uh, in the, the, the ecosystem of scientific evidence so that we can much more efficiently direct our resources to saying that's really important but it's got a low score. We're not so sure about it. Let's follow up on that. Uh, and this right. parts that are credible and we can trust. Well, yeah, translate that to policy. Move ahead. Mm. Whatever. That, I think, is really going to be transformative if, if it will work. Uh, and so there's a massive project that we're a part of and many other groups are involved in. Mm. It's a huge collaboration. More than 800 people have volunteered to contribute uh, to uh, assess the credibility of research claims with experts and then have machines try to assess the credibility of those claims. And then we're running replications of a subset of them to validate whether the experts and the machines. So it's like this huge training set to get yes. machines kind of sp spun up on how to read scientific findings, the importance of like sample sizes versus like power versus, you know, all these different uh, metrics. Um, that's really interesting. That's really cool. Yeah. I, I, my, only, my only concern, and this is more just like cynicism, um, well, I, and actually, so you know, Goodhart's law. Yeah, sure. So I'd be a little bit worried that like everyone would then start figuring out how do I get the perfect machines, score? What do I, yeah, of course, what but do I optimize? You know, what is, what are the machines caring about now? What people behave towards. Absolutely. So luckily, uh, as we know from the Terminator series, the machines will always stay a step ahead. Uh, and so they'll just keep innovating against us. And the, the fight will be glorious, uh, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> they keep making the movies, so I'm figuring it's something that never quite ends. So I don't know how that works. Yeah. But you're yeah. right. That's a big challenge. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I think that's a good way to end it. An optimistic, <laughs> cool idea. Is on Terminator. That's it. With also some challenges in the Terminator. That's really awesome. Um once again, I just want to thank you. I like I, I don't think even my viewers know what a treat it is to have you on. I mean, you're like I was actually shocked when I got you on the show, and uh, I'm really appreciative of your time. I know you're like a huge voice in this whole movement. Oh, thanks. It was a lot of fun to chat, and I'm glad that you're trying to translate a lot of these issues for the more general public to understand what we're wrestling with because it's a very exciting time in science.